Good evening. Welcome to worship this, meeting, this evening, a special welcome to any guests or visitors that we have with us. As this is also the service that goes online and on television and on the radio, we welcome all those who are worshiping with us there. For those on listening with us on the radio, I, Pastor Nick Quinette, will be conducting the service, and our organist is Mrs. Bethany Babnick. Our theme for this service is Jesus Appears as the Anointed One. We have now entered the season of, of Epiphany, the revealing of Jesus there as our Savior. We continue then with the opening hymn, hymn number 384, 84, Hail to the Lord's Anointed. service for this evening is the service setting one in the blue hymnal in place of glory to be God, glory to God in the highest we will sing this is the feast please stand we begin in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit Amen. blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven whose sins are covered Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty and merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed what we have devised and desired in our hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. We have done those things that we should not have done. 
and we have not done those things that we should have done. Have mercy on us, Lord. Spare us, forgive us, and restore us according to your promises in Christ Jesus. God, our merciful Father, has forgiven all our sins. He sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer and Savior. Jesus paid the penalty for our guilt by his death on the cross and freed us from death by his resurrection from the grave. We have peace with God now and forever. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Lord be with you. Let us pray. 
Father in heaven, at the baptism of Jesus in the river Jordan, you proclaimed your, him your beloved Son and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Keep us who are baptized into Christ faithful in our calling as your children, and make us heirs with him of everlasting life. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading comes from Isaiah chapter 42. And here we see that the Lord promises to put his spirit on the Messiah, empowering the anointed one to free us from our sins. We see this promise fulfilled with Jesus in his baptism. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I am placing my spirit on him. He will announce a just verdict for the nations. He will not cry out. He will not raise his voice. He will not make his voice heard in the street. A bent reed he will not break, a dimly burning wick he will not snuff out. He will faithfully, faithfully bring forth a just verdict. He will not burn out, he will not be broken, until he establishes justice on the earth. The coastlands will wait for his law. This is what the true God says. The Lord who creates the heaven and the earth stretch them out, who spreads out the earth and everything that it produces who gives breath to the people on it and life to those who walk on it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will hold on to your hand. I will guard you. I will appoint you to be a covenant for the people, to be a light for the nations, to open the eyes of the blind, to bring the prisoners out of the dungeon, and to bring those who sit in darkness out of prison. The word of the Lord. We continue with the psalm, Psalm 45b, Great are the works of the Lord.
Our second reading comes from Acts chapter 10 and serves as our sermon text. Then Peter began to speak. Now I really am beginning to understand that God does not show favoritism, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. He sent his word to the people of Israel, proclaiming the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, because God was with him. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the gospel acclamation and the gospel. my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. Our gospel lesson comes from Matthew chapter 3, and here we see in the waters of the Jordan, Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus came from Galilee to be baptized by John at the Jordan. But John tried to stop him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, because it is proper for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then John let him. After Jesus was baptized, he immediately went up out of the water. Suddenly the heavens were opened for him. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and landing on him. And a voice out of the heavens said, This is my son whom I love. I am well pleased with him. The Gospel of the Lord. You You may be seated. At this time, please fill out those attendance cards that can be found in the pew in front of you. Another option is to use the QR code that's found up on the screen and also in the bulletin. For those who are worshiping with us online, you can find a link above or below the video. Thank you for your cooperation. We continue with singing the hymn of the day, hymn number 377, To Jordan's River Came Our Lord.
grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. We've now entered the season of the church year called Epiphany. And some of you might be wondering what Epiphany means. What is this season of Epiphany all about? Well, the season actually started yesterday. Yesterday would have been the actual celebration of Epiphany where the Magi came to see Jesus there, which would have been weeks and months after he was first born on that first Christmas. There at that Epiphany, we see those Magi coming, people who weren't Jews but still coming to honor and praise their Lord and Savior as that little baby Jesus didn't just come for the Jews but came for everyone. So we see him being revealed as such. Yet the word epiphany is a word that can be used in everyday language, can't it? Perhaps some of you have used it before where you said, well, I had an epiphany about something. Maybe you were deep in thought about some project or something you were working on or you were pondering something and all of a sudden you had an, a moment of understanding or insight and you say, yes, I had an epiphany on that subject. We really see both of these uses of the definition of epiphany in our sermon text today, where we find Peter having an epiphany about the epiphany of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, some background context to our sermon text for today and our epistle lesson. You see, Peter, when we see him saying these words for us, we see him saying them in the house of Cornelius. Now, Cornelius, he was a centurion. That's somebody who is in the Roman military, somebody who would have been at a higher rank there. He wasn't a Jew, but he was a believer in God, a believer in God who feared God and was devout in his faith. So God sent him a vision. God sent Cornelius a vision to invite Peter to come to his house and meet with him. Now, this would have been a very abnormal thing to do. After all, as Peter gets there, Peter says these words. He says, it is unlawful for a Jewish man to associate or visit anyone who is not a Jew. This was something out of the ordinary, and he would have known that to make this request to Peter would have been a request that would have been strange. Yet God told Cornelius to invite Peter to his house anyway. At the same time that this vision was going on, roughly the same time, Peter was having a vision of himself. uh, himself. God had sent him a vision three times that showed a sheet coming down from heaven that was full of all these unclean animals. Now these animals would have been unclean because, not because they were dirty, but because if the Jews would eat them, that would make them ceremonially unclean. According to the Old Testament law, God said, you can eat these animals, but these animals you cannot eat. And in this vision that God gave Peter, he gave Peter this command. He told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Yet Peter didn't want to because he knew it went against that Old Testament ceremonial laws. When this vision had finished, this left Peter quite perplexed. Why was God telling him to do something that was, well, going against the ceremonial laws? Well, as we eventually find out, those laws were fulfilled there in Christ and no longer had any bearing anymore. But Peter was trying to work through that at this time, trying to figure out what God was telling him. And as he was pondering this situation, those servants of Cornelius came to his house. Came to his house and said, Cornelius is inviting you to come over. Can you imagine how perplexed Peter would have been at that point? He had this vision of things that, well, were going against what he had known before. He's trying to figure that out. And all of a sudden, he gets this request for for him to go over to a Gentile's house, somebody who he wasn't supposed to really associate with. But he went anyway. And when he got to Cornelius' house, Cornelius told Peter about the vision that he had. And so we come to our sermon text today. There we see Peter having an epiphany about Jesus' epiphany. Epiphany about all these visions that he had seen, that what God was trying to tell him. The vision became clear to him about those unclean animals, and he knew why he was sent to this, this non-Jew's house with this strange request. Peter says in our sermon text here, Now I really am beginning to understand, basically he says, I've got it now, that God does not show favoritism, But in every nation, 
Anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Peter's epiphany is really now that he understands Jesus' epiphany. Why did Jesus come? Who did he come for? Not just for the Jews, but to be the Savior of the entire world. He wasn't just the Jews' Messiah, but everyone's Messiah. Every single person on this earth, he came to save, and it was the anointed one, the promised one, to come. And let us not become confused and think, okay, well, maybe this is a change in God's plan of salvation, that all of a sudden God said, you know what, I'm going to open this up to everyone. Because we can go all the way back to that first promise of a Savior. All the way back to Adam and Eve, where God promised a Savior to come to them, where there weren't Jews at that time, there weren't those chosen people, they were just Adam and Eve, and this promise was meant for them and for their children to come. Yet unfortunately, many of those children fell away and didn't hold on to that promise. And even we see that in our Old Testament lesson, that this promised Messiah was for everyone. There, there's a line in that Old Testament reading there which says, the coastlands will wait for his law. This would be talking about those areas around the Mediterranean Sea. Some other translations you might have heard, the islands. It's the areas around the Mediterranean Sea that were not a Jewish area. That was oftentimes a reference to those. Everybody would see, this is not just for the Jews, this is for everyone. It goes on there to say, I will appoint you, it's talking about Jesus, to be a covenant for the people. To be a light for the nations. A light for the nations. Other translations might have Gentiles there. It's clear that this message was not just meant for the Jews, but for everyone. And this was being revealed, an epiphany as Jesus is being revealed as the Savior of the world. To do what? Why did he come? To open the eyes of the blind. To bring the prisoners out from the dungeon. And to bring those who sit in darkness out of prison. To put it in another way, to make everyone righteous to bring them out of the darkness of sin, to bring light to their lives, to bring them out of unbelief to God's wonderful life, light to bring them eventually there to heaven to declare them not guilty before God. You see, what Peter is saying in this text is, I get it. He's saying, I understand that God does not look at the outward nature of a person where he says God does not show favoritism. He doesn't look at where they are from, what they look like, he doesn't look at their social status. It doesn't matter what they eat or drink. It was clear to Peter why he had this vision of this unclean food and why he was invited to this house where he normally wouldn't be invited to. That we all stand equal before God. That he doesn't look at our ethnicity or racial background. But he looks to the faith that we have. We see, he says, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Anyone who fears the Lord, anyone who fears God is acceptable to him. Fear of God is awe and reverence to him, looking at him as who he is, God, the Almighty One. You could say that's faith. Those who believe in God are those who are righteous before God. Is that faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior makes you righteous because of what Christ has done. And don't misunderstand that second part where it says, does what is right is acceptable there? This isn't talking about works righteousness. Notice how the flow of it goes. It does those who fear the Lord first. You see, you are right before God. You do what is right and acceptable to God because you are already declared righteous. Because your sins have been washed away. Because of that faith that you have. Your works and the things that you do don't earn that righteousness. But you go and do them and they are righteous because Christ has made them righteous before God. Because they're done out of faith and love to him. And as, Jesus, and as Peter has this epiphany, notice where he goes next. Notice what he makes reference to. Jesus' baptism which we are celebrating today. You could say that baptism there at the Jordan was an epiphany as a way, as it was revealed to the people there that this was the anointed one. This was the Savior of the world to come. We see that as what's described in our gospel lesson where it says, after Jesus was baptized, he immediately went up out of the water. Suddenly the heavens were open for him. 
he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and landing on him, and a voice out of the heavens said, This is my Son, whom I love. I am pleased with him. God was showing everyone that this was his anointed one. This was the promised Messiah that was promised all those years ago. This was the anointed one for the nations, the king of the nations, standing right in front of him. This is the one whom Isaiah was talking about in our Old Testament lesson for today. The one who would bring righteousness for all people. We see further proof of it throughout Jesus' life. There, Peter makes reference to it, him saying God was with him. God was continuing with him whenever, wherever Jesus went and whatever he did. That means Jesus was constantly doing God's will, constantly doing what was needed for our salvation. We even see there on the Mount of the Transfiguration, not that long before Jesus would die, that God again says, I am well pleased with him. And what are some things that Jesus did while he was on this earth? Well, God was with him. We see him going to a Samaritan woman, someone who the Jews didn't necessarily want to associate with, but there we see Jesus going to where? To all nations. He was interacting with another centurion there and healing the servant there, another non-Jew, which would have been frowned upon. But Jesus went there because he was the anointed one, the Messiah for all the nations. You see him talking with tax collectors and so-called sinners as people who would look, other people would look down upon because of their way of life. He would go and, and be around prostitutes as well. He'd go and be with the lowest of the low because he came to be everyone's savior. Jesus did this and did God's will all the way to the end. There where he was even dying on the cross for our sins, we see him reaching out to everyone, being everyone's Messiah and everyone's Savior. Even for those who put him on the cross, what is Jesus doing? As he's up there, he's praying for them. And even as he's up there taking on the sins of the world, you have the thief on the cross there, who's up there, who's done all these terrible things to earn what he did up there, but... Jesus continues to proclaim that message of hope to him and gives him that hope of eternal life that he would be with him in paradise. There we see that Jesus was the promised Messiah, the promised Savior for the entire world, and he is revealed as such. And there on the cross, he took on all the guilt and pain and punishment for all our sins and the sins of all the world. To do what? To declare us righteous, to declare us not guilty. And as we're celebrating Jesus' baptism today, we can't help and think about our own baptism. Our own baptism where water with the word was applied to us, and their faith was worked into our hearts. There at the baptism, we were connected with Christ's death and with his resurrection. And there we were made righteous through God's word as it worked faith into our hearts as we were connected with his death and resurrection. And there in baptism, what do we see? We can see that Jesus there in the Bible, he gives the great commission to go baptize all nations, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. There again we see Jesus revealed there as the Savior of the entire world. To go proclaim this message, to proclaim the good news as verse 36 says, that works faith in all our hearts. And that faith brings us peace and hope there, as verse 36 also says. Peace knowing that Jesus came for the entire world, that it was revealed for all, which means he was revealed for you. Think about that. As he's revealed for the entire world, it seems like a big, wide-open thing, but it's actually personal. That means as you are part of the world, he was revealed as your Savior as well and came for you personally. As you think about that, let that shape the outlook as you look at others in the world around us. You see, Peter was perplexed by what God had told him at first and shown him with that vision and the request that came from Cornelius to come to his house. It was really what it was doing was pushing Peter out of his comfort zone. And although we know that Jesus came for all and he was revealed that he came for all, so often, it can be hard to push us out of our comfort zone. 
it can be hard for us to proclaim this wonderful message of peace to everyone because we don't like to leave what's comfortable to us and leave our group of people who are just like us in every way. It could be hard for us to go and proclaim this message to people of another race, another culture, another ethnicity as it's pushing the boundaries of what we feel comfortable with. We like to divide ourselves in groups that look and think much alike. And if people may dress differently, if they may act differently than us, then we may tend to stay away from them a little bit more. Or maybe we run into people who maybe may act or look a little bit scary, or maybe they dress nicer than we do, and, or maybe dress worse, and we might not want to leave our comfort zone to reach out to them. Or be apprehensive like Peter was. Or there could be others who maybe did something that was wrong or committed some terrible deed, or maybe they were in jail or in prison or even killed someone. We can be tempted to say, well, Jesus was revealed to all, but he might not be revealed for this person. Or maybe we might look at someone and say, well, I don't know if they are having the right motivation in coming, or I don't know if they are really the church type. I, I really shouldn't reach out to them. In a way, what we're saying is, well, God must not have come for them, which couldn't be further from the truth. You see, what we see with Christ's epiphany is that he came for all people. So, like Peter, we need to have an epiphany about Christ's epiphany, that he was revealed for all, and he doesn't show favoritism, which means we need to reach out to all with this message of God's word. Not depending it on where they come from, how they act, or what they look like, or what they did in the past, or what we think they might do in the future, but see them as who they are. A human being. A human being whom God has created to live on this earth, whom God wants to be saved, to come to a knowledge of the truth. A human being who God has personally sent his son, Jesus, to come and live and die for so that they can go to heaven as well. We have that in mind. We can look at every single person who is in this world as an evangelism opportunity to share with them this wonderful gospel message as we're motivated knowing that Christ was revealed. He, his epiphany was to show that he came for us as well so it motivates us to proclaim that to everyone. So go through your life every day, pondering the wonder that God has sent his son for the world, and pondering that Christ and God do not show any favoritism. Let's work on having an epiphany about the epiphany of the Lord, that he came for all. Amen. Please stand. We continue with confessing our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we'll collect our offerings of praise and thanksgiving to our Lord and Savior. Please also place those attendance cards in the offering baskets as they are passed. Thank you for your cooperation. And we love because Christ first lo we loved us. We continue with our next hymn, hymn number 370, How Lovely Shines the Morning Star.
In our prayers for this evening, we include a prayer for Val Sheenemann, who will have surgery on Thursday. And for those who are hospitalized, Daryl Kirshner and Karen Deals. And also for the family of Cindy Sneeder, who uh, was called home to heaven last week. Her funeral was yesterday. You may remain seated for prayer after the intercessory prayers will join in the responsive prayer of the church. Dear God of all comforts, we thank you that you, that in your fatherly love, you gave your merciful guidance and constant blessing in the body and soul throughout the life of Cindy Sneeder. Help her, your holy word comfort those who are grieving. Strengthen them with the assurance that in all things you are at work in truth and love. Teach us to number our days. Help us seek the things that are above, that we may at last appear before your presence in peace and joy. And dear physician of both body and soul, we ask you to be with all those who are hospitalized or had or will have surgery, including Val, Karen, and Daryl. Watch over them and strengthen their faith in you. Be with the doctors and surgeons that they may do their job well and grant all a swift recovery if it be your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God and Mary's Son, in the fullness of time you came into our world to save us from sin and death. Beloved Son of the Father, revered by the Magi, baptized by John, you came preaching and teaching, healing and comforting, forgiving and encouraging. Prince of Peace, shine like a beacon for us and the people of our world. Let the good news of salvation be heard in the remotest corners of the earth. Open our own lips to speak your name to those around us who still live without faith or hope. Lord of the Church, let your peace rule our hearts, that we may use our gifts to serve you and each other in willing gratitude and joy. Watch over our loved ones near and far, that they may remember your love and rejoice in your salvation. Strengthen the faith of the sick and the disheartened. Give hope to those in despair and comfort those who mourn. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. Finally, bring us and all your believers to the heavenly home where we will stand in the full light of your glory and with all your saints and angels sing the everlasting song of triumph. We continue with singing the next hymn, hymn number 385, Christ Begins.
Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May, may we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And we join in the prayer our Lord and Savior taught us. Our Father Amen. in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. We continue with the closing hymn, hymn number 950, Lord bid your servant go in peace. <laughs> Great to have you all in worship this evening. Uh, just a number of announcements. Uh, tomorrow uh, we have our typical schedule then, getting back to normal after a little break of Christmas of where we will have in between those services, uh, the morning and the, the nine, excuse me, 7.45 in the 10.30 service, we will be having Bible class and Sunday school down in the basement along with the Youth League Bible class down in the council chambers over here. Wednesday Bible class is starting up again at 10 a.m. in the council chambers. They are continuing their study of the 10 lies about God. If you've ordered your poinsettia, please pick it up after any of the services this week. Undecorating will, of all the Christmas decorations will be 9 a.m. on Saturday. Help is needed for that. There will be a voters meeting on next Sunday, uh, not tomorrow, um, but the, the next Sunday following it, um, right after the first service before Bible class then. So we're going to be um, having a call meeting to be calling our, our ECM director, another ECM director. Live streamers are needed. You can see the bulletin for um, information. We, I believe, need about six um, to be comfortable with that. We are far below that. So if you're interested in helping with live streaming, uh, please look at that. Talk to myself or Pastor Miller and, um, or talk to uh, Joe Curia, and we'd love to have more there to help spread out the workload with that. The tubing slash ski trip at Sunburst will be January 14th. Uh, there's information there in the bulletin for that. Uh, you need to sign up with the link that's there by the 10th. Uh, I know there was a previous sign up. That was the initial one to make sure we had enough people to sign up. We do to get the group rate. Now we need everybody to sign up in the link that's provided there by the 10th then. Um, so that would be on January 14th. We'll be going, but sign up by the 10th for the deadline. Those are all the announcements this evening. The Lord bless your week. Oh, we do have a Wells Connection before I say, before I say goodbye. So, Wells Connection, and then the Lord bless your week.
Hi, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. As we enter a new year, it's only natural to reflect on the previous one and to thank God for the amazing blessings he gave us. 2022 was a year when a number of synod-wide events and gatherings returned after the pandemic put them on hold. One of those gatherings, in fact, the largest regular gathering of Wells members, was the Wells International Youth Rally in Knoxville, Tennessee, with roughly 2,000 attendees. We don't just want it to be an experience at a cool place. We want to equip them. Uh, we want to equip those that are called and those that are willing to lead them and, and deal with them at such a critical time in their ministry. In addition to the youth rally being back in person, so were events that show support for Wells Home, Joint, and World Missions, such as the Lutheran Women's Missionary Society Convention and Taste of Missions. To everyone in the pew, to everyone um, who gives offerings, gives prayers, sends a letter to a missionary, befriends a mission, anyone who does that, just thank you because it, it, it does not go unnoticed. It is so, so appreciated and I always felt like um, a number of times over the years, you know, that letter came at just the right time, you know, where you were struggling or having trouble with something and, and it just showed up and it's, it's super cool. So thank you very, very much. 2022 brought word of new ways that our church body is continuing to connect people who are far from God to their loving Savior. The first was the launch of a new world mission in London, England. Our God has been gracious and has given us a, a new life. I think the religious institutions that are kind of native to this country have lost their way in uh, a lot of senses um, and people are crying out for something more substantial. Also, Wells Home Missions announced the ambitious goal of starting 100 new mission congregations over the next 10 years so that we may, Lord willing, connect more people like Lauren in Atlanta to their Savior. Learning God's love and grace for you and compassion and forgiveness, it's freeing. It's freeing and it opens your, it opens your eyes um, to a whole different way of living, to, to live life and look at life from a completely different perspective. With all those potential new home missions, we will need additional pastors, teachers, and staff ministers to lead and serve those congregations. Wells continues to provide a high-quality education system that encourages and trains the next generation of called workers. They have opportunities to go out into congregations and schools uh, to shadow a pastor, to learn from a teacher in the classroom, to really get that hands-on experience so they can say, I love this. I do not think we can overestimate the importance of this place if we want the gospel to live on, not only for us, but our children and our grandchildren and for those surrounding us in our communities and world. As local churches serve their communities with the gospel of Christ, Wells Congregational Services continues to provide resources so they can faithfully conduct their ministry. Without having that understanding myself from personal experience to know what it's like to be in the military and, and what are the best ways that we can serve them, I think that's just helpful to have those resources and you know, I don't have to figure it out myself. Resources that help local churches connect with Wells members in the military, as well as programs that help congregations build a bridge from children's ministries and schools to church membership. The purpose of telling the next generation is help a congregation have a plan. When they come, how do we connect with them? How do we build relationships? And then how do we connect them with Jesus? All of these various synodical ministries work together to allow us to carry out our calling as Christians, motivated by the love of Christ. This coming summer, our Synod Convention will be held at Michigan Lutheran Seminary to approve our ministry plan for the next two years. Topics that are scheduled for the 2023 Synod Convention include addressing the pastor and teacher shortages. These include the announcement of a significantly larger graduating class coming out of Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary and new initiatives out of Martin Luther College for teachers. 
A highlight of this year's convention is the official declaration of fellowship between Wells and two new church bodies, Iglesia Cristo Wells Internacional in Latin America and the Obadiah Lutheran Synod in Uganda. In Vietnam, the new theological training facility for the Hmong Fellowship Church will welcome its first class of students. This training facility was built to instruct leaders of the Hmong Fellowship Church who serve nearly 140,000 members with the message of God's free grace. It's clear that our Heavenly Father has great things planned for our church body for this new year. We may not yet know exactly what they all are, but we can be certain that wherever he leads us, he's able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine.